It is so fun to hear you guys talking and chatting. Excited to come to the house of the Lord. So welcome to Kick Off Sunday. Let's stand. Let's worship together. Sunday to Alexandria Covenant Church. If you're watching online, we're so grateful to be with you this morning as well. And for those of you who haven't been here for a while, we want to welcome you back and praise God that uh, you're joining us in a new season of life and ministry where we're going to go forth with the good news of the gospel, praising God for the change and the transformation that he makes in our life. I want you to know that there's a connect card in the pew in front of you. If you are here today and you're new and you would love to get connected to us, please fill this out and place it in the offering plate on the way out, or you can simply put a prayer request or concern in here. We'd love to follow up with you as well. 
But we've just come through a weekend where many people took time to reflect and to remember the impact that 9-11 has had on our lives and on our country. And I want you to know that to certainly be praying for those people that these lives has impacted, and, and certainly all of us as well. But let me remind you of another truth of our reality today. The gospel of grace through Jesus Christ has changed everybody who by faith has accepted Jesus Christ. The change is not just for today, but the change is for eternity. And for the next several weeks, that's where the focus of our time is going to be. That is good news. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful today. Grateful to be able to gather in this place and worship you to kick off a new season of life and ministry in this church. As we begin today, we we think of the impact that 9-11 has had on our lives and on our country. But I also want us to look to you and to the cross and to the word of God and to the hope that the gospel of Jesus Christ can not only bring to our lives, but the change, Jesus, that you bring to our lives every day and the change that you bring to our lives eternally. Father, as we spend time today and in the weeks to come in the book of Galatians, open us up to the new reality that we have freedom in Christ. Freedom not to live how we want, but to freedom to live how you want us to live. As we worship you today, receive it with gladness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's continue to worship. Accept it, redeemed by His grace. Let 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for your forgiveness. We recognize our need for you. We recognize the need of the gospel in our lives. We recognize that you're our only salvation. So thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to alert you to a few announcements, but uh, make sure you take a look at the bulletin. Today, we're so excited. We're launch our fall kickoff. So we have Sunday school classes going on right now for adults all the way down through our little children. And uh, those are advantage, those are, you can take advantage of. They're listed in your bulletin on the back side. So make sure you take a look at that. We have all kinds of things launching this week. Uh, youth group and Awana on Wednesday night. We have all kinds of different studies, adult Bible studies, as well as different things you can be involved in. And you can check those out. Uh, some are in your bulletin. You can check them out in the patio. There's ways to sign up. Uh, so just make sure you're, you're following along with those. We'd love to have you involved. I want to uh, remind you of a couple other things, too. Tonight, 6.30, uh, we have a prayer meeting. If you are interested in coming and joining us in prayer, it's just a sweet time of being able to pray for, pray for the needs and the people in our church. If you have a prayer need, there's a yellow card in front of you. Uh, fill that out. Drop that in the offering plate or at the Welcome Center. There's also the reverse side has praise announcements, um, things that you're praising God for, and those are things that we want to pray for, too, and be encouraged uh, along with you. 
Next week, we have something special, Pizza with the Pastors. Um, everybody likes free food, so this is Pizza with the Pastors. If you would like to get to know the pastors, if you're newer to the church, uh, you have some questions, we are meeting right after our third service around noon downstairs, um, and we need you to sign up if you're interested because we need to know how many pizzas to order. So you can sign up on our, online on our app or at the Welcome Center. Um, we'd love to have you join us, especially if you are newer to the church, uh, and just get to know you and you get to know us. We have an announcement uh, by, our, by David Levon, our tech director. Take a look at this. Good morning. My name is David Levon, and I am the director of technical ministries here at the church. Over the past few months, we have been working hard to find ways that we can better communicate with you all. And today I want to talk about some changes that we have made to the mobile app. Our goal is to have the mobile app be the central point where each person can go to find out what is happening in the church, whether it be looking to watch a service, um, to bring up the sermon notes, or to join a group, the app, mobile app will be an easy way to stay engaged. We have completely restructured the app to make the experience as, as simple and intuitive as possible while still allowing us to curate a relevant experience for you. Without going into too much detail, I would just ask that each of you please download the app on the App Store by searching for Alexandria Covenant Church on your phone or tablet. And if you already have downloaded the app, great, no changes, you just need to open it up again to see, get the new experience. We would love to hear any feedback you have on how the app is working for you or on any ways we can make the experience even better. Thank you. In your pocket or in your purse, uh, you can download that app, uh, and it is amazing. I just wish you could see what, if you can see it this far, but I wish you could see what's on this app. Just on the front page, um, there's places where you can put your needs for prayer, there's a connect card, there's all those different kinds of things, but there's also a place where you can click on it and it goes right to the sermon that Pastor Trinity will be speaking to today. Uh, it has sermon notes that you can take on it, it has a Bible passage, it has an overview of the sermon, um, there's a connect button on the bottom where you can connect to all the different small groups, all the different things that are happening if you want to sign up for one. If you go home today and it's like, I know they mentioned something, I can't remember what it was, uh, that I want to sign up for, it's on here. You can uh, go to the events uh, page and you can find all the different events that are happening. If you forgot what time Awana and youth groups start on Wednesday night, it's on there. Uh, you can go to the sermons and watch a sermon. If you missed one, you're out of town and a couple weeks ago, you can watch it right here on the phone and there's a give button. So there are all kinds of different ways that we get to connect with you and you get to connect back with us. We want to make that as easy as possible for you to do that as we communicate with you what's going on here at the church. Just one last announce, announcement, and that is that we take an offering at the door at the end of the service. Please give generously. It just helps us be able to share the gospel broader around the world as well as in our community. Thank you. So good to see you all this morning. And before we get into the message today, I want to draw your attention to the pink rose to my left and your right, uh, indication that we have a new baby girl born to our church family, Kyla Jo McFarlane, born to Levi and Hannah. They were at the 8 o'clock service, and so they're not here this morning at 930, but uh, let's just praise God for the arrival of this new little baby. I'm really excited for kickoff Sunday. Uh, we're kicking off into a new sermon series as well in the book of Galatians. Uh, and I'm calling this series Living in Freedom 
every day. Living in freedom every day. The, the book of Galatians is really intended to set the record straight on what the gospel of grace is all about and the freedom that it can bring to our lives as Christians. A kind of freedom that doesn't allow us to live however we want to live but the kind of freedom that helps us to live the life that God wants us to live. That's what this series is all about, living in the freedom of Christ every day so that we can live the life that God has for us to live. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. As we begin our series in the book of Galatians, Father God, open our hearts and our minds to receive your teaching today to receive the truth of the message of the gospel that has the ability to change our lives, to transform us from the inside out, to give us a life of freedom, but also to help us to live in freedom, a freedom that comes in knowing Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to open to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we'll read through verse 10. You can follow along on the screen as well if you would like. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers, we can add sisters, who are with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I've been reading a lot about freedom these days. Many of you may have been reading about that as well, but for various reasons. One of the interesting things that I find about freedom is that freedom has a way to bring about challenges to our lives that maybe we wouldn't expect. For instance, for somebody who has spent a great deal of time in their life in and out of jail or in and out of prison, when set free, they can find it to be really challenging to know how to live free because they've been accustomed to life behind the walls of the prison that they find themselves in or the system that they've become accustomed to. Prisoners who struggle to adapt to the freedoms that the outside world brings are known as institutional syndrome. That's, that's a, there's an actual name for those who struggle with this. It's called institutional syndrome. People who suffer from institutionalization often need help navigating life in the free world. If you've ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption, the character Red, played by Morgan Freeman, he's the one who characterizes the reality of someone who's been institutionalized for over 40 years and then has been set free into society only come to realize that his freedom hasn't really brought him the hope that he had intended it to bring. But it brought a level of despair because he didn't know how to live into the freedom that he now has. 
He was accustomed to his life behind the walls in the prison system. Similarly, Paul is writing here to the church in Galatia, and I would even say to us as well, about what it truly means as Christians to live into the freedom that we have in the person of Jesus Christ. The true gospel that brings freedom in Christ is about the grace of God at work, bringing about salvation to people's lives who repent of their sin and turn and trust in Jesus as he calls them unto salvation. Not only does Jesus bring salvation to our lives through the gospel of grace, but it's also through grace that we can even live the Christian life every day. Essentially, Paul is saying in this letter that in Christ, you are set free from the bondage of sin and religion. You're set free to live a life of freedom in Christ that is based on God's grace and not on the law, religion, or your good works. This is the issue that Paul is dealing with all throughout this letter that that we're going to evaluate and consider how this letter affects our lives even today. Galatians, uh, let me give you a little framework for for this book, some foundational stuff that is good for you to know. Galatians was really a circular letter. What that really means is that when Paul read it and sent, wrote it and sent it, he sent it so that it could be shared amongst churches in the region of Galatia. Where is that located today? It's modern-day Turkey. It's likely that this was the first, maybe the second letter that Paul wrote in the New Testament to the churches. Many would suggest that it was around 48 or 49 A.D., when this book or this letter was written. And it came shortly after Paul's first missionary journey upon which he went through the region of Galatia and established many churches upon which he is now writing them to encourage them to live into the same freedom that they found in Christ now as believers in the church. Now the churches in Galatia were comprised of both Jews and Gentile converts Galatians was written really to combat or to address some false teaching that had infiltrated the churches from a group called the Judaizers. Now, who are these Judaizers? Judaizers uh, were Jewish converts to Christianity, you could say, likely from the area of Jerusalem, who had been sent or had come into the region of Galatia to teach these new believers, that yes, you should believe in Jesus, and yes, he is the Messiah. But they also came to teach that salvation was based on your subjection to the law or adherence to the law, not based on grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. They were bringing their Jewish influence to the church, which was changing the message of the gospel. And that's what the core of this letter to the Galatians is all about. Paul addressing the changed message of the gospel through a group of people who have infiltrated the church and are calling on these new Christians to adhere to the Old Testament law, to be circumcised, For circumcision and Old Testament law, rule following was the only way they said you could actually get salvation through God. To which Paul is saying, whoa, 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 time out, Uh uh-uh, nope. Mm Mm-mm, let me fix this and correct this quickly. It's interesting, if you were to read through all of Paul's New Testament letters, you would find that he begins the letters with all of the niceties you would expect within the beginning of an introductory letter, like, I praise God for you, I'm thankful for you, I'm so encouraged by the life that you're living, on and on and on and on. Then he gets to the heart of the message. But that's not true of the book of Galatians. Paul doesn't 
uh, begin the letter with all of the niceties. He simply just gets to business right away. He doesn't have time for the niceties. He's got to address something that is making a mess of the church. And so as Paul gets to business right away, I want to get to business right away. So hang on, here we go. From the onset, Paul established his apostolic authority in bringing a word to the Galatian church. Paul speaking with apostolic authority means that he was one who came bringing the word of Jesus himself. He had that type of authority. That's what an apostle had. In order to be an apostle, you had to live with Jesus, be with Jesus, see Jesus die and rise again and spend time with Jesus. You need to be called by Jesus and sent by Jesus to be a messenger in the world. Paul was not one of the original 12 apostles. He even said, I'm, I'm one of the oddball apostles. I, I'm different than the rest. Because Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, where Jesus radically changed his life, where he called him into ministry and where he equipped him and then he sent him into the Gentile world to bring the gospel to people as one who is now an apostle of Jesus Christ. But Paul is also speaking with another kind of authority, more of a parental authority. The spiritual father of the churches throughout Galatia, after all, it was these churches that on his first missionary journey, he planted, he established, and now he's teaching them, he's guiding them, he's equipping them to live into the life that God has for them. As Paul launches into this letter, he rightly points out the effect that the gospel has on believers. In verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, grace is how the gospel comes to us. And peace with God is the result of the gospel in us. Paul wanted to establish that right from the get-go. From here, Paul gives a brief description of the gospel that comes by grace, which results in peace with God and reminds now the believers that as you have entered into a peace relationship with God through the saving grace of God, through the person of Jesus Christ, I now recognize that you're abandoning that grace-filled life for a form of legalism. That is not about the grace of God at all. Paul says that Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Essentially, what, what Paul is telling us is that, is that God sent Jesus to deliver us. He sent Jesus to rescue us. The implication is that we as sinners are in need of rescue. That we as sinners are in a predicament that we ourselves cannot get out of on our own. That the only way that we can get out of this predicament is if God by his grace provides a means for it. Paul's reminding the church in Galatia that, that no listen, God by his grace provided the means of your salvation and also provided the means for you to live a life of freedom in Christ. So don't turn back to legalism. Press on forward with the gospel of grace. God's solution to our predicament of sin is his son, Jesus Christ, to be sent as a rescuer for us. The rescue plan that God has for us is purely an act of God's grace. We must understand that. I want you to imagine that you've come across somebody who's drowning. You ever done that before? I have. It's frightening. But the misfortune, or maybe privilege, you could say, of saving five people from drowning on the North Shore up by Duluth. 
It was scary. But there's many different ways you can approach a drowning victim. One of them of which uh, I could have thrown a, a swimming manual at them and said, hey, I want you to read this while you're floundering, while you're sucking air and drinking water. Would you read this? Because it has all the information you need to get out of the predicament you're in. How's that going to work? Is that what we do? No. What do we do? We throw him a rope, a life preserver. Better yet, we jump in the water and we rescue them because they can do nothing for themselves but die. This is who Jesus is. He's our rescuer. And this is what we need most, to be rescued. See, nothing about who we are or what we do can save us. It's absolutely true. This is why the gospel of grace is so important. The word gospel simply means good news. The good news of the gospel takes us back to an event in history where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born into this world. He lived just as the Scripture said. He died just as the Scripture said. And on the third day, God rose Jesus from the dead just as the scripture said. In order that through Jesus Christ, you and I could find life, eternal life and abundant life. Because of God's grace for sinners like you and me, God sent his son to die in our place so that we could be reconciled to a holy God. That's good news. See, Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He rescued us from the pit of hell. He rescued us from our sin. The good news about Jesus, you've heard me say this before, and I'm not going to stop saying it, so get used to it. The good news of the gospel is simply this, that Jesus came to live the life we couldn't live. He died the death we deserved to die so that we could gain a righteousness we could never gain on our own. That's the gospel. Salvation that God provides to us is free to us. Oh, free, yes. How? By his grace for us. And when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Keep in mind that God's grace involves something more than a person's salvation. That's true. God's grace also involves giving us everything we need daily to live the life of a Christian, to live the life that God has in store for us to live. You know, the significance of God's grace in our life is really realized when we recognize that we are utterly bankrupt before a holy God and have nothing to offer that would be sufficient to pay for the penalty that our sin deserves. By God's grace, we are reconciled to a holy God. We are justified by faith in Christ alone. That's the good news. Paul transitions into verses 6 through 9, and he uses some of the strongest language in all of the New Testament to defend the true gospel and to set the record straight on what the gospel of grace is all about and the implication that it has for your life and mine. In verse 6, we read, I am astonished. What Paul is saying, I'm surprised. I can't believe it. I'm absolutely overwhelmed. Did you get that? Is it dramatic enough for you? I'm astonished. You're so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Paul is perplexed. He absolutely cannot understand what is happening to the churches in Galatia. You were called by grace to salvation. When I was with you, you were living the freedom in Christ that comes by God's grace. But now that I'm gone, these Judaizers have come in and they, they, they've made a mess of things for you. They, they've turned you from the grace of God to a form of legalism, which is no grace at all. What's going on? 
Why is Paul so troubled? Because what's happening here doesn't make any sense at all to him. To desert someone is to abandon them. Paul is pointing out that any time we make Jesus plus something equal salvation, we abandon Jesus and we no longer rely on the grace of God. And that's exactly Paul's concern. He's hearing that these believers are abandoning Jesus. They're turning to someone or something else rather than the grace of God. They're depending on that someone or something else for their salvation. This is a problem. How surprising in this is this? It would be no different than for us to consider a soldier who strips himself of their gear and crosses the enemy line only to want to put on their gear and turn around and fight us. Makes no sense. The language that Paul uses here is of one who is in the process of switching teams. They haven't switched yet, but they're in the process of switching teams. It's kickoff Sunday. Yes, here in the church, but also, if you didn't know, in the NFL. What Paul is saying, to, to, to illustrate this, to bring the point home, is this. It would be like one of the Minnesota Vikings today, who, by the way, are playing the Cincinnati Bengals. In the second quarter, they decide to just take off their uniform, walk across the field, and begin looking for a Cincinnati Bengal uniform to put on so they can play for that team. This is how ridiculous it is. This is the nonsense that Paul is saying. I can't believe this is happening. But what he's also saying is this. It's like you get to the other side, but you can't find the gear. So you haven't made the change yet complete. So there's still hope. Paul's concern, I believe, is not, and you need to hear this. Paul's concern is not that the Galatian church, that the new believers in Galatia are in jeopardy of losing their salvation. I really don't think that's the issue all throughout this letter. I think Paul's real concern is that they will lose clarity on what the gospel is, and that will take them into a tailspin life of living a life of confusion as a Christian. If you are saved by the gospel of grace, God is going to hold you tight for all eternity. You see, Paul addresses this issue of new believers being drawn into confusion and being tossed back and forth through different teachings. And in the letter to Ephesians, when he writes, Spiritual maturity will help us from being tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. Spiritual maturity will help us not to be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. What is Paul asking? He's asking for us to be spiritually mature, to grow up in Christ, so that all these teachings of the culture will not influence us False teachings from with the church will not influence us to live a life outside what the gospel of grace is intended to bring to our life and the gospel of grace and the intent for us to live into the freedom in Christ that it brings for us. Verse 7, Paul goes on to say, not that there is another gospel, because there's not. There's only one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Paul's point here is clear. There really is only one gospel. But he recognizes that the trouble that the church is in, in effect, is because there's outsiders who came in and are now trying to put down his message and bring a new message that distorts or perverts the gospel of grace. The Galatians are troubled by believing a message that isn't true, but it sounds good. 
That's what a false gospel does. And that's what religion does to us. When we step outside the gospel of grace and we begin to live our lives through a religious system, we like that. I'll tell you why. Because it provides a mean for us to be able to evaluate our acts of righteousness and then helps us to feel as though we're making a contribution to our salvation. That's a false gospel. You don't contribute to your salvation. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Your good works do not save you. And this is what Paul is trying to correct. To distort the gospel or to pervert the gospel is to really change its meaning. This was the problem in Paul's day. And every generation of Christians since Paul have had to combat this in the church, the perversion of the gospel of grace. And today is no exception. Remember, Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Salvation is only and always by the grace of God. There are many ways that both the church and culture are perverting the gospel of grace and changing its message. So this morning, I want to speak to some of those ways. But in order to do that, I need you to understand this is not easy. And so since I'm stepping into a place of discomfort, I'm going to invite you into that place of discomfort with me. The text demands that I say what I'm going to say. It's not easy. And it's going to make us all feel very uncomfortable. But receive it with grace and love. In the church, the teaching that baptism and confirmation is required for salvation is a perversion of the gospel. Baptism is not a requirement for salvation. It's by grace through Christ. Some of you grew up with a tradition that says, in order to receive the fullness of God's grace, you must be a recipient of the seven sacraments. It's a perversion of the gospel. What that really means is that through your acts of righteousness, God would then impute to you or give to you a degree of grace is not true. Your acts of righteousness are not how you receive the grace of God. Let's bend a little bit more towards an evangelical bent. We have made a mess of the gospel by telling people if you pray the sinner's prayer, attend church and read your Bible, you can have confidence or assurance that you'll be saved. If your salvation is dependent on a prayer, your church attendance, and you're reading your Bible, you're living into the perversion of the gospel. Faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace alone, will save you. Many want to teach that your goodness counts for something. That if your goodness outweighs your bad, then by all means, if God is good, he'll let you in, right? No, he won't. Because your goodness is still bad in the eyes of God. This is ways the church has perverted the gospel. Let's invite the perversion of the culture into the church that is now perverting the gospel. These days, the influence of a democratic ideology, which many would claim based on morality, would lead us to say things like, 
If you're a Democrat, you cannot be a Christian. Would lead us to say things like, if you're a Republican, you cannot be a Christian. I want to equal the playing field there so that we can all equally either like each other or hate each other. I'm not sure what it is. Lighten up for a minute, would you? (laughs) This isn't easy. (laughs) For Republicans, abortion, defense of marriage and family life are issues we stand firm on. For Democrats, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, and justice issues are things we stand firm on. Here's the problem with that. Those are moral issues that are not based on politics. They're human right issues. If you're a Christian, I hope your salvation is not dependent on the political party that you affiliate with. Because if it is, it's a perversion of the gospel. The human rights issue of abortion, defending the defenseless, defending the family, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, bringing justice to this world. These are issues of the gospel, they're not politics. If you're a Christian, stop claiming your allegiance to the political party that you're a part of if you find your salvation being in one side or the other. We need to be united on these human right issues because the gospel demands it. Liberation theology swept through the church in the 70s, and again, I think it is today. When you combine that with the social justice movement of our day, it's threatening the gospel of grace. Far too many Christians are attempting to bring change to society through social reform and then the name of social justice without Jesus. rather than through the gospel of grace, which will radically transform any society that it infiltrates. I hope you heard that. You see, justice without Jesus is exactly that. It's just us without Jesus. The only way the world can become a better place is through the gospel of grace. More importantly, the only way that you can be saved and I can be saved is through the gospel of grace. And equally important, the only way we can live the gospel is by the grace of God. The gospel of grace is being attacked at an alarming rate these days. The culture wars of our days are are seemingly making a mess of the church and are attempting to alter the message of the gospel to make it look more like social justice and social reform than any form of grace at all. It's a perversion of the gospel. How are you, through your life, perverting the gospel? I want you to listen to Paul's words and what he has to say about those who are altering the message of the gospel. We just went through a whole lot of things that made all of us feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? But listen to what Paul says for those who pervert the gospel. The strongest damning words ever used in all of the New Testament are right here. A double whammy. But even if we are an angel from heaven, him is including himself now, by the way, even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one received, let him be accursed. 
What is Paul saying? I'm going to give it to you straight. In no uncertain terms, if you pervert the message of the gospel, what Paul is saying is you should then be condemned to hell. That's how strong this is. And that's how serious we need to take the gospel. How do you transition from this? I don't know. But look at what Paul says in verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul clearly expresses that a life that is changed by the gospel of grace will live to please God over pleasing people. For Paul, this meant that he had to stand up to and against everything he used to stand for. You see, Paul, he stood for circumcision. He stood for the law. The Judaizers are saying you must be circumcised and you must obey the law or you can't be saved. Paul actually stood for that. Paul stood up for the idea that my religious works mean something to God and it's the way I prove myself to God. Paul believed that. Paul also persecuted Christians. This is what Paul was for and now Paul is against it. Because Paul's life and his message was changed by the gospel of grace. He was changed by grace. He now lives by grace. And his message is the gospel of grace. As this was true for Paul, he's saying it's true for you if you are a Christian. Let me remind you that we not only are saved by grace, but we also live by grace. We are to stand in grace because grace is the foundation of the Christian life. Let me ask you, in what ways do you find yourself adding to the gospel? Remember the gospel is Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus plus nothing. It's easy for us to fall into the trap of legalism. I'm going to define that as trying to earn the approval of God through our moral or religious activity. If this is something you struggle with, I want to encourage you. Give it up. Find practical ways for you to abandon legalism so that you can live into the freedom that only Christ can bring. And never forget It is by grace that you are saved. And it is by grace that you can live the Christian life. Let's pray. Worship team, come on up. We're going to close with this song. Father God, I'm grateful today that your gospel makes a difference in our life, that it is a gospel of grace, that God, it gives us hope in a future. Help us to abandon not the gospel of grace for legalism, but to abandon legalism for the gospel of grace. Help us to confess any way that we've perverted the gospel so that we can live truly in the freedom of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we close in the song together.
of the gospel of grace, we can claim that Jesus is our living hope. And that's such good news. Amen. 
before you leave today, you should pick up your kids from wherever they're at. <laughs> Stop by the patio. We've got signups for adults and cookies and cakes and I don't know, coffee, all kinds of stuff in there. Check it out, conversation. But may you go with the grace of God. Peace be with you this week. Bless you. We'll see you next week. Have a great day.